Please go ahead. Usually we give up to one or three, so just almost one or two, I think uh, we're leveling off with people maybe, and people are still joining. Um, just wait one more minute and then we'll just start. So, um, <clears throat> and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and Ramadan Mubarak to all of you who are celebrating. And uh, it's, uh, you know, yet again, uh, one of the series of the Apna Merit Subcommittee uh, in terms of healthcare research and innovation landscape in Pakistan webinar series. And we took a little hiatus and then started our webinar from last week. Uh, and this is the second in series. And those of you who are familiar with the format, we have a presentation for about 45 minutes or so, and then we give uh, the next 10 to 15 minutes for question and answers. If you have uh, any questions, put it on the Q&A tab. And uh, our moderator today is uh, Sayed, uh, Dr. Sayed Uzair, who is um, whose brainchild is Apna Marit. So, um, Thank you. So, um, so today's um, speaker is very well known to Apna Merit, and uh, we welcome back Dr. Junaid Bhatti, who uh, has presented before in this platform. And today he's going to talk about the preparing manuscript following Equator Network reporting guidelines. And I'm sure uh, most of you who are involved in clinical research are at least familiar with this equator guideline which was developed by the oxford university and when you submit a manuscript you have to use that um so a little bit about dr janet bhatti he's a long um, illustrious career he's a phd trained medical epi epidemiologist he's currently working as a senior data scientist focusing on healthcare analytics and medical writing and digital insurance at one of the largest financial institutes in canada in the past he has worked on academic positions at McGill and University of Toronto. He's actively volunteering to manage post-secondary education at, of clinical skills to healthcare professionals in Canada. Uh, he has over 62 publications to his uh, credit, including in peer-reviewed journals, such as JAMA Surgery, JAMA Neurology, and Lancet. And of course, there's a long uh, list of his accomplishments, but uh, in interest of time and uh, to benefit from uh, Dr. Uh, Bhatti's um, talk, I will hand it over to him. So again, welcome uh, to all the participants and welcome Dr. Janet Bhatti uh, for uh, again uh, agreeing to come and talk to Apna Mary. Please take it away. Yeah, thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity to present uh, another, uh, you can say a brief talk on Equator Guidelines. So I understand that most of you who are experienced uh, uh, researchers who are at assistant or associate professor level positions in the U.S. are familiar with the Equator Network, but it's still uh, a little bit less known to junior faculty. And I feel that it's it's important to understand where Equator has re arrived now, especially in terms of different. Speak up a little bit. Yeah, so it's still not good. It's good just to speak up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to to see where uh, you um, where the equator has arrived in terms of different types of studies that it covers, and it helps us to to write different manuscripts. It's mostly like about tips because when you are starting to write a manuscript, trying to understand uh, where you should be in terms of like uh, writing. Um, and developing your manuscript, what types of headings that you can use. It's mostly around that. Um, so uh, a brief introduction for me was uh, presented before, but I'm physician trained um, by MBBS and then uh, moved, uh, like completed an MSc and PhD in epidemiology and public health, um, and then completed postdoc at McGill University, followed by uh, 
five-year uh, research position at University of Toronto Affiliated Research Center at Sunnybrook Research Institute. And then currently I'm working in a financial institution, learning more about how to, uh, how to uh, uh, apply advanced analytics as well as artificial intelligence in different types of business decision making. Um, currently I'm also uh, looking after um, the Canadian College of Healthcare and Pharmaceutics. It's a post-secondary education institute. Um, it's it's a private for-profit, so in, in based in Toronto, so we are accepting international students. I also dedicate uh, time to different uh, non-profit organizations, including one that I mentioned here, South Asian Canadian Health and Social Services, so providing them support in developing different um, programs, uh, um, as well as different health education presentations that I give them from time to time and also develop some knowledge translation tools. So what is a reporting guideline? So a reporting guideline is a simple structured tool for health researchers to use while writing manuscript. Uh, so these reporting guidelines uh, came into existence around 2003, 2004, when Equator Network was started to formulate more formally and since then, uh, many uh, academic journals have adopted these guidelines. It started with consort statement that we'll be discussing in the next few slides, but it does not stop there. It also extends to different types of study designs, and it's important to understand that how we can utilize them in writing, uh, um, writing a manuscript. So a reporting guideline provides a minimum list of information needed to ensure that the manuscript can be, for example, understood by a reader, replicated by a researcher, used by a doctor to make a clinical decision, uh, and included in a systematic review. So it's a minimum list of information. So your manuscript may have more information, more headings or subheadings than what is mentioned in an equator guideline. So a per, a pre, the reporting guideline includes checklist, sometimes a flow diagram, depending upon the type of study, uh, or structured text to guide authors in reporting a specific type of research, uh, developing using exp explicit methodology. Um, so this is the website of Equator uh, Network, like how it looks like. So it's an umbrella organization that brings together researchers, medical journal editors, peer reviewers, developers of reporting guidelines, research funding bodies, and other collaborators with mutual interest in improving the quality of research publication and the research itself. And as you can see in the different types of studies that are mentioned on the right-hand panel, so you have randomized trials, you have observational studies, you have systematic reviews, study protocol, diagnostic and prognostic studies, case reports, clinical practice guidelines, qualitative research, animal preclinical studies, quality improvement studies and economic evaluation. So in front of those, you are seeing some abbreviations, for example, in, term, in front of randomized trials, you are seeing consort statement and then extensions. Extensions would apply if a randomized control trial is from a certain field or expertise, then you can click on extension and you'll be able to see that which specific type of consort statement will apply. And we will discuss that later in this uh, presentation. Then in terms of observational studies, so we know that observation studies are of different types. We have cross-sectional studies, cohort studies, case control studies. And when you're writing the manuscript for those studies, so strobe statement can help you to find or to, to sort of a think about what are the minimum um, like headings that or subheadings that you need to have in your manuscript. Then we have the systematic reviews, uh, PRISMA guidelines can be used and you will see there are some other extensions available. Study protocol spirit, so that currently many people have started using or publishing uh, study protocols for that spirit guidelines is available. And then for diagnostic and prognostic studies, start guideline is available and then so on and so forth. Yeah. So um, I know that uh, uh, some of you have gone through the last lecture uh, developed, delivered by uh, Professor Sarvat. So he talked about PICO, which is uh, how you frame your research questions, population, patient problem, intervention exposure, comparison and outcome. So the studies can be divided or designs can be divided in different ways. So one way is that you are doing studies descriptive, which will have only population and outcome. For example, you have a survey and qualitate or qualitative studies. It's important to know that, so, so to, to know which of those uh, equator reporting guideline will apply to you. So 
why we are trying to do this is to go in a, in a certain way that we are in terms of merit uh, these lecture series what we are trying to do achieve is that we try to take a subject of like how to frame a research question and then when you're writing a re your uh, your uh, research manuscript how you can use that information to then figure this next step that which of the guidelines would apply to your your manuscript so if you're doing a survey obviously you have to look for the equator guideline that applies to surveys or qualitative type of studies and if you're going for analytics analytical studies then you end up having either experimental design of the studies either you're doing a uh a trial so trial can be a randomized control trial or can can be a quasi experimental studies where you just uh, for example there are situations in the surgical trials that you have only a one group of patient where you are applying um, a certain technique so you are have only end up with before and after design but there's still in experimental studies you are taking consent from the patients uh, before you are doing that so in that case you still have you can utilize the experimental um, you can use the guidelines that will deal with experimental studies. Um, obviously, consort is very well known at the moment because it sort of deals with randomized control trials. They are very well sort of a thought out. So what are the minimum requirements? And obviously, we want to use the randomized control trials for uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, later on. So it makes sense to make sure that everything that is required to be reported to assess the quality of that manuscript or those findings uh, should be there. And in terms of observational studies, obviously we have case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and cohort studies. And when you're talking about these three studies, obviously you have a strobe guideline that covered these groups of study but then you can uh, and it has some some variation in it so to account for different types of study population how it must be reported within the equator guideline then you have another way of looking at these studies so when you're trying to de develop your own um, sort of a like career so you usually starts with case study case series uh, sometimes those case reports in journals, uh, then you move towards cross-sectional studies, case control studies and cohort studies, trials and systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So it's important that you understand this way also is that when you're trying to work is that what type of study that you're working on, uh, is, it a, is a case report, uh, is there a equator guideline available to guide me that what type of heading and subheading are available for me to write the manuscript and you can just, and it, it makes your life extremely easy if you are able to understand what equator is, what specific guideline applies to your own study. And then once you take those headings and subheadings, then you can start filling the text. Again, it provides a minimum checklist, which I understand you can go beyond that, but also sometimes some of those headings or subheadings may not be relevant, but you need to have a clarity that why they are not relevant in, ca in case you are developing your manuscript, because uh, when you go to the journals right now, if you are uh, submitting a journal, uh, a publication with a, for a randomized control trial, they will ask for consort. Many journals started looking for, if you're submitting a case control or cohort study, they will ask for strobe statements. So it sort of will have, um, if you have an understanding from that perspective, if you have um, integrated that uh, tool already in your uh, approach for writing the manuscript, then you will not have to do that effort again to understand whether it's something that you're missing or not. Um, so then you have cohort studies, trials, and systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So all of this sort of a, like, puts us in the frame of like uh, the how we can utilize these guidelines. Is there any question or anything that uh, that requires a response? Okay. So there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to answer it now. Sure. Uh, no, no, I from, think that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. It's from Dr. Yeah. Zia Islam, and he has um, mentioned that uh, he's a student of healthcare management from Air University is, is in Islamabad. And his question is that how we can conduct research practically, because there is a rate system, ROTA system, probably, in almost all universities in Pakistan. So ROTA system means that they have, uh, like, he's to doing a clinical uh, like sort of a thing. So uh, I think that can, I can reply to that later um, if it was related to yeah. more of my work. Probably. Can... So yeah, uh, I think this is the only one slide if you are able to capture and understand um, in, in this whole presentation, then it will make your uh, sort of a decision making about which of the equator guidelines would apply to you. And I took it from, I'm like, I do not develop myself. I took it from the equator. Uh, but since this is more of a like 
uh, uh, combined learning activities. So um, it helps us to see that which of the guidelines would apply. So I've shown you the name of the guidelines. I will dive deep in few of those guidelines, which I feel are important for, um, as I said, junior or a middle career researcher who's just beginning to sort of like uh, increase their portfolio of different types of research. So the first question that I will begin is that, was the research on humans? Um, yes and no. So if the response is no, so if it's done in a lab, then um, then you will have to uh, use the ARRIVE guideline, which will take into account what are the different headings and subheadings to be included in that, that sort of arrangement. Then did your research uh, generate quantitative data? No. Then you have different ways. Did your pool of the results have previous studies? Then you have uh, NTREC, and then there's a CARE guideline. So these can be used. And important thing is that if you are uh, sort of like summarizing clinical case series or cases, yes, then use CARE. And if it's a clinical case or case or not cases, then you use SQRQR. So I think care guideline is important if you're using clinical case or case case series among all the ones that are mentioned or are originating from this uh, this decision that as a quantitative data is generated. If it's not quantitative data, then if you're talking about clinical case or series of case studies, then SRQR guideline you can use. I have not used it personally because uh, I do not deal with that, per, but many of the clinical, uh, like, uh, people who are working in different hospitals, sometimes they have interesting cases related to COVID or maybe some other conditions, so they can use this SRQR. And once we have finished with this uh, presentation, you will have a good idea of that, how you can um, know which of those guidelines that, you, uh, which of those, how to use those guidelines. So if your gen uh, research generates quantitative data, did your results combine, analyze, review the results of previous studies? Uh, if yes, obviously when you're trying to review the studies, then you are going towards a systematic review or, or meta-analysis. So it depends upon, is, you, is it a review of observational studies? Yes, then you use the MOOS or MOOS guidelines. If not, then you'll use the PRISMA guidelines that apply to systematic reviews and meta-analysis because it means that these, this decision results is that you are either summarizing observational studies together or you are summarizing the, uh, the studies that have some trials uh, including randomized control trials. So there you will be using PRISMA guidelines. So I will spend more time on PRISMA later on this presentation. Now I'll go back to this decision. Did you combine or analyze or review the results of previous studies? Yes, and then you go on this side. But if no, then was your study a randomized trial comparing two or more health interventions? So if you're using a randomized trial, then you end up with strobe statement. So this third row is very important for you in terms of when you're doing more of epidemiological or clinical epidemiological work, uh, as well as international research in your field. So if it's an international study, then you will be using consort statement. If not, then you'll be exploring, then if your study is exploring the relationship, between an exposure and outcome, then you will use strobe statement. If not, then it can be a diagnostic accuracy study. And in case that is diagnostic accuracy study, you will be using STARD guidelines. So mostly people at this point will be using either SRQR for clinical case studies, um, MOOS or PRISMA, especially PRISMA guidelines, if they're using or sort of are going through the uh, summarizing the results for randomized controlled trials or any type of experimental study PRISMA guidelines. Then you have consort statements for pure randomized controlled trials and STROP statement for uh, observational studies. And if in cases that you are trying to, especially people who are working in the radiology and imaging side, so they often have lots of studies published in imaging and they are trying to sort of, uh, or they, they, they want to report their own so they can can use the start guidelines. There are also other guidelines that are available, but in my experience, we have used more consort statement, Prisma, Prisma, Prisma Strobe, and start guidelines, but there are others that exist. So this, when when I'll, I'll make this presentation available to you, it will make uh, sort of like provide you a decision making chart of based on the study designs, which you discussed on the last slide, uh, which you will determine when you're framing your question, then then your research methods, that what type of guidelines should I use. Now, important thing here is that uh, even when you are developing your protocol, there are guidelines available, which talks about protocols that what needs to be included. So sometimes you're writing for a grant or sometimes you're writing for uh, for a, uh, 
for your uh, ethics review board. So you can use this spirit guidelines or Prisma P uh, for that ex extension to develop your own uh, study protocol. Uh, I will not dive deep in this one because it's I'm more focusing more on the studies uh, that are being completed in which you're figuring out the manuscript. But in case you are developing your study protocol, so you have something available through Equator that can help you uh, sort of like formalize your protocol and not missing any major points in that. Yeah. So um, I will try to click on this link. I hope that I go to the uh, appropriate link here. Um, so it's important to understand how you can navigate. Uh, so this is a link that will appear on Equator Network. I'm just going to make it bigger. So this is again um, available on Equator Network. So this is Equator Network website. Uh, and the website allows you to access different types of reporting guidelines that are available. So if I click on consort, it will bring me to the consort statement and the different headings and subheadings that are required for me to properly report my randomized control trial if I have conducted one. But it's also important that you can use this reporting guideline tool so you can select the studies from here based on what you have done as a study, for example, observational studies, then you have different clinical areas. So I was mentioning that uh, you have, you're seeing a lot of extensions here. So extensions are available uh, for the statements that were produced maybe 10, 20, uh, 10, 15 years ago. So now the, there are extensions available. So if you have done in, like for even for observational studies, if you want to go to specific genetics related um, uh, headings and subheadings, so you will be able to find if there are one. So obviously this is a generic list based on even if one of those uh, field areas have included any type of that extension, so they have included, maybe you'll find, maybe you won't find, but it allows you to go there. So I'm just gonna um, go more on the experimental studies and then probably uh, select uh, anesthesia and then whole report if there are any. So it's gonna show me if there is something that is relevant to that has been published. If not, then I can move to another one, for example, cardiovascular medicine. Or I can go for study protocol, observational studies. Interest free. So, for example, these are the guidelines that are available, probe 2023, for guidelines for reporting observational studies or endodontics. So, this tool can help you to figure out what would be the best headings uh, or subheadings that will be available. The generic statements, like strobe statement, will always be there for you to get to those, those areas. But then you still have a tool available of recently published, published studies that will allow you to figure out what with the heading and subheadings that will be uh, sort of a, like help you to develop your manuscript in that specific area. Now, moving on to the next thing. So uh, now I, I will try to sort of a go through the different uh, checklists, which I feel um, are key in terms of uh, work of a medical uh, or clinical epidemiology, as well as those people who are doing research uh, um, uh, in the clinical setting. So obviously, consort statement is quite an uh, old statement, I would say, but there are recent extensions available. And so the recent extensions that I have not mentioned today also extends to what are the different types of, um, uh, what are the different information that you need to have in when reporting the outcomes. So as you can see, when you're writing your manuscript, so uh, the section and topics on the left side of the consort statement, for example, Titan and abstract. So when you're writing your uh, your uh, your study, you need to have a title, you need to have an abstract. So those headings need to be in your manuscript when you're writing. Then in terms of introduction, background and objectives need to be there. When you're writing your methods, trial design, participants, intervention, and outcomes. So that is part of the method that should be there. Sample size, randomization, sequence generation, allocation consignment, and implementation. Okay, how you're going to be implementing. So all those details are available through the consort statement to help you not only figuring out what are the headings that you need to include, as well as uh, what uh, 
how the processes will, will be happening. So this will uh, deal with the methods and then So I'm just going to the next slide here. And then the methods continue in terms of blinding, that how you'll be doing the blinding, which is a randomized controlled trial with blinding. If it applies, then how you'll be performing the blinding. And lastly, the statistical methods. So when you're writing those trials uh, or writing your manuscripts, you can copy these headings. So make sure that you are not forgetting anything. Then in terms of results, you have a participant flow. A diagram is strongly recommended that I will show you in the next page. Um, then you have the recruitment, how is the recruitment completed, the baseline data, numbers analyzed, outcomes and estimations, any ancillary analysis and harms. Um, and then that will be followed by discussions, limitations, generalizability, interpretation, as well as other information such as registration, protocol and funding. So the, the heading and the, the diagram that goes with with the, this type of consort statement is it looks at the enrollment that how you have enrolling whether you are excluding certain participants or not so this is part of the consort statement so whenever you are uh, uh, drafting um, uh, a randomized controlled trial for the study you need to have this consort flow chart also included as part of your manuscript because it will be looked into and as i will show you in the next two slides after this uh, from the lancet website that not only this is a requirement for most, including I will say, including all of the journals um, that are peer reviewed and are indexed in Medline, that they try to follow. Uh, I, will, I don't use, I shouldn't use the word try. They follow the consort statement whenever uh, someone submits to them a randomized control trial. Without that, you cannot get your study published in, in, in those, those journals. And that's why it's important because when you're in the early career uh, of your uh, um, stage of your career, you're not designing your randomized control trials and everything, but then once you start doing those things, so uh, sometimes people do not get uh, a chance to, to see that what will be expected of them when they're submitting their their randomized control trial with which they spent that much effort in a proper journal because that information comes very late in in that process but if you know about this equator guidelines before then it helps you to prepare you accordingly so you can see here is that in the enrollment how many patients were excluded refused to participate there are different headings available sometimes those headings are subheadings will be relevant to you sometimes they won't then in terms of allocation if you are doing the randomized control trial how many how many uh, patients were allocated to an intervention or the other intervention or the control um, received an allocated intervention or not so you have those numbers and then obviously when you're doing a randomized control trial there is a follow up that you need to perform so how many patients were lost to follow up or discontinued intervention and then finally obviously you have all these uh, patients who we may or may not be followed up till the end, but then how many were available for the analysis where you have the full data available or if the patients were excluded from the analysis. So all of that is included in the flowchart. So I looked into uh, uh, the Lancet uh, just to tell you that when the Lancet is is looking for your publication, what, what they will be asking for. So consort statement. So I looked at their formatting guidelines for a randomized trial. Consort statement 2000 guidelines are a part of it. And most of the journals, I will say all of the journals um, up to this point uh, that are peer reviewed and publishing medical research, they follow the same uh, same guidelines. So this type of uh, 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 like integration of equator guideline as well as the the journal's own um, recommendation, they are now more and more integrated. And as you can see, that they provide that you need to have a background of the study. The summary should be more, not more than 300 words, then there are methods. And those uh, methods follow the same pattern as the consort statement. But if you're following the consort statement, you will not miss any major subheading or heading that you need to include. And then you have the findings that will be part of the your study. Important thing here is to notice that the journal also wants you to have this flow diagram available, and it is more, uh, it is closer to what the uh, consort statement is asking from you. So if you are following the consort statement, you will also be fulfilling this requirement to have this type of um, uh, this type of. Uh, 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 flow diagram available. Obviously, there is this diagram is more related to um, it's a Kaplan-Meier curve that is more related to randomized control trials. So those who do this these types of trials, they know that they need to draw this type of diagram. Also, importantly, that you have to have um, 
the results available in terms of those comparisons uh, comparisons of of the different uh, groups subgroups in your in your patient population with drug a or drug b one of them may be interventional other may be control so to have that available but again um, the requirements of a journal are now more and more aligned to what is required from consort statement so if you go back to the consort statement all the headings and subheadings when you're writing your manuscript if you have followed this pattern this will allow you not to miss anything. Obviously, you can change some of the things may come up or down based on uh, um, on your writing style that can still change from a person to the person, but you have to report all this information and you have to follow uh, the, the journal's recommendation. And as I said, like most of this uh, consort statement as well as um, these, uh, these uh, guidelines, they are now more aligned to each other. So uh, moving on, so again, um, I talked more about the randomized control trial where you can use the consort statement. Um, another group of studies, uh, which most of you may have a chance to do during your career are observational studies. So in observational studies, we have cohort studies, case control and cross-sectional studies. So the statement that covers uh, for that is called strobe statement. So it's, it's different from a randomized control trial because you are not doing an intervention as, as uh, Dr. Sarvath may have explained you in, in the past lecture is that you have an exposure on one end, but uh, uh, in this type of studies, and then you have intervention in the, in the studies that uh, relate to, uh, to the maybe randomized controlled trial or other experimental studies. So in this case, again, the title and abstract remains the same. So it's a good, good news. So if you have get a hang of this equator uh, network guidelines, so you won't be missing anything, then you have the background and rationale. Again, the explanation is available. I don't want to get into too much detail because we do need to cover a certain part of things today and also provide you an opportunity to uh, to interact up, upon this. And then we have the study design. So you have to describe the study design settings, describe the setting and locations. And then you have to look at here, cohort study, case control study, and cross-sectional studies. Because we're talking about the participants. So you see the distinction that how the different uh, groups are or uh, designed elements in, are included. And also you see that for the cohort studies, matched studies, you have to give the matching uh, criteria for those in which that method is applied. So these guidelines are quite comprehensive. So they don't uh, miss any key elements of the design included in them. Then you have to explain the variables or my years, data sources that you are using, any um, data sources and then any measurement bias because in, in the consort statement, we're talking about the blinding, randomization, but here you have to talk about the bias and different types of assessment methods that are used. Study size, um, it can apply if you're doing any types of those studies and you want to come up with a reliable uh, outcome measures. For example, if you are measuring uh, smoking prevalence, so you need to have um, a study size available so that you can provide that. Then quantitative variable and statistical methods. So describe all statistical methods. And you can see that in the cohort studies, they are talking about how the loss of follow-up is being reported. In case control study, how the matching is done or cross-section studies, describe an analytical method and sensitivity analysis. So all of these things are also help you not to miss any type of thing that you may otherwise miss in terms of the methodology because they try to cover all those uh, things together. So this is the first part of strop state, stroke treatment. Uh, and then the second part will again continuing on the same, uh, on the result side, uh, describe the participants for each of the studies, eligible and ineligible participants, uh, non-reason of participation, characteristics of the population, and then wherever it makes sense it will also distinguish between a cohort study so in cohort studies you will report number of outcome events or summary measures over time in case control studies so report numbers in each exposure category or summary measure of exposure and cross section studies report number of outcome events or summary measures then you have the main results of study other analysis in the discussion, you have to discuss, always start this, uh, in the discussion section with key results, then limitations, then interpretation where you are trying to relate your uh, study results to the interpret in terms of the interpretation, um, like uh, prior, prior studies that are available, some information about the generalizability. If you find that X is linked to Y, whether other studies are consistent with that 
or maybe there are some other biological evidence that exists. And then other information would include uh, funding information. So that covers the strops, a strop statement that we can use. So um, I went into detail for consort and strop statement. Most of the, the research that is done in hospital settings usually lies between the two, either you're doing observational studies and or, uh, uh, or controlled uh, or uh, interventional studies. Again, consort statement will only um, uh, stop or you can restrict yourself to randomized control trials, but the headings can still be used if you want to use it for others, or you can find an appropriate uh, appropriate equator guideline. Then um, I want to also discuss about the PRISMA. So another group of studies that is conducted at the level of um, hospital or clinic is the random, uh, is the these uh, systematic reviews, how we can conduct that. So. The reason that I include this is also because uh, it is different from cons uh, from randomized controlled trial or observational studies. So you have you, the the reporting guidelines will adapt to what is required, and then when you're writing those types of um, uh, studies, so you will know that okay, um, I have this type. I've re uh, reviewed these ten studies, but how I can summarize these results? So all that information is sort of a, like uh, this type of uh, guideline helps you to sort of come up with what would be required in that. So in Prisma guidelines, you start with title and abstract, um, and then introduction. You talk about rationale why you want to do this, any objectives, methods, eligibility criteria. So you are looking for exclusion and inclusion criteria for review and how studies were grouped for the synthesis information sources so you have to look for databases registers so sometimes you're using medline uh, or other types of databases but also some other methods so you are, have to describe them your search strategy selection process for those studies data collection processes data items so uh, when you're extracting the data from the study so you have to tell that you're took the data about the population, uh, maybe in which country that, that study took place and all that information. So these are the data items that you'll be collecting. Study risk of bias assessment. I will discuss this bias assessment in in few slides. So it's very important to distinguish between bias assessment or quality of the study assessment as well as reporting guidelines. So these two are related concepts, but different in, in their execution. Then effect my years. So if you're trying to uh, summarize the results in terms of the risk ratio, how those risk ratios can be computed together, um, then synthesis methods, uh, how you'll be synthesizing the results. So again, it provides you different uh, approaches, tabulation, et cetera, that you can use in synthesis of results. Reporting bias, if that exists anytime, anytime. so there are specific um, uh, evaluation quantitative methods that are available for reporting bias. Uh, having this available will also push you to see that if you're not missing anything that you need supposed to do, especially with the uh, with the, uh, uh, systematic reviews, you already have the data available because the studies are not going to change. Like you have the list of, if you're doing 20 studies, they are there. So if you're following the Prisma statement, you won't miss anything. Then certainty assessment, any type, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a little bit more statistically heavy process, but you can still do it. A certainty assessment uh, uh, based on the studies that or study data that you accumulated for your systematic reviews. Then the results, you have to explain the study selection. So first you have the methods and then the results. So what you're describing in the method at a certain point, it starts sort of like aligning with the results. So uh, when we talk about the study selection, so you'll have to describe the study. You, there you describe the methods of how you're doing the study selection. Here you sort of describe those methods and how that resulted in in your selection of those studies study characteristics for example studies are from us or europe so all of those characteristics those items of three items will help you to do, uh, develop this risk of bias in studies um, results of individual studies so you can also talk about the results of individual studies and instances that you perform how you're going to be tabulating the results uh, looking for that um, heterogeneity that exists reporting biases that if, if they exist and certainty of evidence. Again, depending upon to what extent your review is going. Then you have a discussion section. So normally the first section is always the general interpretation of the results, then limitations, then linking it to prior studies. And finally, that what are the implications of those results to overall, overall field of science. Um, so now you can also register your systematic reviews as well. Uh, so registration process is separate. 
Uh, so if you're conducting any uh, uh, review, especially reviews can sometimes take between one to two years. So if you registered your review, there are registries available that also helps you to determine whether someone else is doing the same work or not. Any support that is available, financial supports, competing interest, and then uh, availability of data code and other materials. So that is part of the Prisma statement. So Prisma statement is relatively, you can see here is that it was produced in 2020. So it has relatively newer items of data and code. Normally that was not a discussion before, but now if you're doing an observational study, experimental study, uh, you are expected to also include your code as well as data in the supplementary materials because it's online available or online repository so it's not like most of the journals are publishing online so that that repository is available so think about that in terms of how those things will apply so these guidelines definitely help you sort of figure out where you can sort of, sort of come up with these headings when you're writing your manuscript um, then um, like consort statement and unlike observational studies there is also a flow diagram available with prisma so this is a generic version of how the flow diagram is available Ro records identified through database screening or through other sources as i said those who have some experience of doing the systematic reviews there are other sources such as gray literature or uh, garment reports that are still used so you have to also search the data then records with duplicates removed and then record screen for relevance and studies including qualitative or quantitative synthesis. And this is, there's another way of uh, doing it. So it's basically identify and the identification of the studies, then you screen for them and then include it. So you have another way of reporting that how your process is going. You're not doing a randomized controlled trial. You don't have that thing, but still a flow is needed for people to understand why you have included certain studies and include other studies uh, because of the different reasons that you include. So the more knowledge that you have about these guidelines, the easier it becomes to conduct your own study as well as reporting that later on. Now, I do want to stress on one thing here in, in the last few minutes is the difference between a reporting guideline and a qualitative a quality assessment tool. So the equator guidelines cover reporting guidelines. So that reporting help people to see that how the study was conducted, whether they want to replicate. So it has certain items that are needed to be there. So title needs to be there, abstract needs to be there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So then there is something called quality assessment tool. And I've seen many people confusing this quality assessment tool to uh, to, uh, to uh, reporting guideline. But quality assessment tool scope is, is relatively narrow. Then the reporting guidelines because it only looks at the quality assessment that how you conducted the study to arrive at your results uh, maybe you did something um, incomplete or something missing in how you uh, screen your patients or uh, whether you include all the groups or not so i have included in this one so um So once you have this presentation, you will have the access to this link uh, on that page that I was showing uh, you here. Um, so it will it will allow you to go to that specific link um, here uh, in this one. So there's a link available this uh, here. So this is the NASH, NHLBI, so National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So this link will allow you to see if you're doing uh, assessing a study for quality assessment. So I talked about the PRISMA stat statement uh, before, and PRISMA is when you are trying to summarize the studies uh, together for results. And those studies will be case control studies, for example. So when you're looking at that quality assessment, so it will talk about quality of the study and not the reporting guideline. So reporting guideline allows that everything is properly reported, but quality assessment comes later with a narrower scope. So it will say, was the study population clearly specified and defined? Did the author include simple size justification? So each of those points, yes, will give a certain score. And it helps you to determine that whether you think that the study is good or fair. So there are different methods, different like hundreds of tools available 
to uh, to assess the quality of the study. So I will stop here in terms of like what the quality of study would mean. But for important point here is that you should distinguish what a reporting guideline that helps you to, to make sure that you're not missing anything. But when you're summarizing the results together, there's something called quality assessment tool. So that also helps people, especially when they're summarizing the results, is to figure out what uh, what uh, like element that relates to the quality of that study is, is missing. And again, the quality assessment tool uh, in the end allows us to, to see whether the study results are believable or not so before we include them in our evidence. Yeah. So again, uh, this link sort of helps us to uh, navigate through the... Uh, to the Equator website. So as I said, um, you don't need to go through my presentation. If you know about the Equator network, you can just Google it. If you click on consort statement, so it will sort of give you idea of different studies where it's published. The word version is available. Uh, flow diagram is also available. If you click on any extensions, that will also be provided uh, sort of a, uh, make you go through that. And I've shown you that if you are be beginning to understand where your study would, would uh, would be lying or you can also select um, and the study that you are planning to do if there are any specific area and see if, if it's already been published or not so those type of studies will will show a pair that will be specific to observation and consort if it exists yeah uh, so so this i have uh, for now uh, um this is these are my email uh, my email or my connect uh, uh, my email contact so that you, you are able to connect to me if you need to for any other additional information. I will make this slide available to Valid so that he can he can utilize them. So I'm not sure to what extent people um, have known Equator guidelines, but I believe that they are still very important in terms of the different developments that have happened in Equator guidelines, especially this uh, this uh, you can say decision tool that helps to determine which type of study would need which type of equator guidelines in terms of developing your manuscript. Thank you so much, Janet. That was an excellent, excellent, excellent and practical talk. Uh, there are a number of questions in the chat, uh, but I will hand it over to Dr. Ozer uh, as our panelist. There are two quick questions about what is the strobe and what does PRISMA stand for? And I just copy and pasted what uh, the acronym stands for. But then there are some other questions, but I will uh, let uh, Dr. Azar take it over from here, and then uh, we can have a moderated question and answer session. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Sarfraz, and thank you very much, Junaid. I think that's a wonderful presentation. I know you. Dr. Azar, need to speak up. Your we can barely hear you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think uh, I am in Pakistan, and you know the connection is a little bit disturbed. So uh, I'm trying my best really to speak louder. Uh, Junaid, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I think now I am audible. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> basically, the, you know, we have a lot of requests from uh, people from Pakistan. So they are looking to have more formalized pattern of capacity building. So uh, this is not part of this question answer, but I was just wondering if there is any possibility that, you know, there is some specific mentorship and a more organized uh, capacity building, which you can really uh, lead in that direction. But coming back to the <clears throat> question, so the first question that was reiterated by Dr. Sarfraz that some, some student, uh, healthcare management from Air University, and the question is how we can conduct research practically because there is a rota system in almost universities in Pakistan. So would you like to comment, please? So I, I, again, I, I uh, have a little bit understanding of the rota system, but I'm assuming that it means that they have uh, like either the teaching responsibilities or clinical responsibilities that uh, give them very less time for uh, writing research. Um, the, if that is the question, then I understand that really well. Um, many uh, people who have different responsibilities, teaching and clinical, they often are overwhelmed by the work. Um, I do think that some universities provide 
opportunities like block time or reserve time for research. So if you ask for that 10 to 20% of the time, then uh, of your time is blocked for research, then that can help. Again, it's, it's tough. Um, it is an underpaid work as a research, especially if you're working as a clinician scientist and if you have interest and, and look for it, most people are pursuing as, as a passion rather than really a paid opportunity for them. And sometimes it also means that they are giving up on revenue or pay um, in that. So um, it's it's a tough question. Um, um, and again, in Pakistan, if there's no protected time, then it, it's, it's always uh, um, a, not a, a good thing to attract uh, um good think good thinking people to this type of field so so i i don't have much than that thank you uh, another question is that can you enlighten the detailed step of systematic review and what are the difference between systematic review and review article yeah so uh there are few papers available on uh pubmed um that basically distinguish between the different types of review articles. So um, review article is often uh, under, uh, like misunderstood in, in by many people. So review article can be a collection of 10 articles, five articles, depending upon how much effort you want to put. There are some uh, review article types, I, I'm forgetting the name, that are just uh, done on what you have found in the first uh, um, iteration, like you are just looking on the Google and the PubMed, and then you found 10 articles which are very specific to a, uh, to a certain topic, and then you summarize that in a review article format. Then there are review articles in which you select the different databases, for example, Medline, there is uh, Sinahil, which is uh, which looks at the nursing and allied health sciences, PsycInfo. So uh, yes. yeah. Yeah. you have the different ones that are available that you can utilize it. To, um, to select all the studies that are published from a certain year to a certain year, and you have a specific list of keywords that you're using for that. I will try to um, give another talk at some point about how we can uh, conduct those type of systematic reviews. But then the third level, or you can say the highest level, I shouldn't say third, but the highest level is the meta-analysis, where you have the results available from several studies that have a similar quantitative measure, for example, risk ratios or odd ratios, then you can conduct a meta-analysis. So the steps, Prisma guideline helps you, or Moose guideline will help you to determine the different steps, but you will have to do some research on Medline what are the types of randomized, uh, um, what are the types of the uh, reviews that exist and what type of review that you're doing. Um, I don't have time to find it. I just don't want to waste the time of other people to finding that, but um, I will see if I can post it to, or provide a, one very good PubMed article that I found that helped me to understand the different types of review articles. Yeah, you know, there are uh, similar questions like narrative review, scoping review. Yeah, narrative, so scoping review is the name. So narrative review, scoping review, systematic review, and uh, and uh, uh, the, the meta-analysis. So these are the four major categories of different reviews that are available. Thank you so much for, for okay. mentioning that. So the next question is, how can we check if an author has used chat GPT or any other artificial intelligence tool for writing a manuscript so this is in these days <clears throat> very attractive words so people are much more concerned and you have a great appetite for the use of ai i know you personally yeah like yeah so we have checked uh, chat gpt i have personally checked it chat gpt is uh, uh, so they have different models so it's called large language model llm uh, they are trying to accumulate the data or that uh, information from the uh, from the different sources that are open access available and then building large language models on top of it. I believe at this point, it is not up to that extent where it can write an, a proper research article. If even if you use it to write certain sections, you will see that it's, it's sort of a, like mention the same words again and again, or style, style remains the same. You can, um, enter in the prompt for chat GPT that what you want to write, but at the moment, it's not up to that mark that where we should be worrying. Maybe some reports would uh, would help, but people who are using chat GPT, if they don't know how to properly use it, it does not give you the right type of right kind of results at 
the moment. So I think we are a little bit far from that, not very far, maybe in two years time, it will be able to, to write the full research article. So at the same time, there are some people who are working, especially from the academic side, because uh, we don't want students or um, other, uh, other people to use this tool uh, to come up with different things. Uh, but at the same time, there is also an appetite on the other hand, is to reduce the time that is spent on unnecessarily on just correcting the stuff or not. So um, we have not found the balance yet and I think the debate will still be open. So um, there are some tools available uh, that are that people have said, okay, they can identify that style of writing. But at the moment, I think uh, if you're working as an academician in, in a university, you shouldn't be too much worrying, but keep keep like looking for if something uh, like how to what keep looking at chat gpt as a technology that to what extent it has developed and try to also learn from it because in my personal opinion it is going to save a lot of time when you are um, trying to communicate uh, science to others because if it, it can do a better job in generating the text um, uh, that is appropriate for a certain audience so nothing better than that thank you so I feel very excited. We have uh, Dr. Shahid Rafi and a uh, few others, you know, who are the architect of Apna Merit research activities and they are very instrumental. May I request Dr. Shahid Rafi really to add his views and thoughts and, you know, the processes to start and, you know, take it as a capacity building, please. Dr. Shahid Rafi. Thank you, uh, Zerbay and... Uh... You know, Junaid and others are more uh, capable than me, myself, uh, in private practice in, in the field of research. I'm, I actually joined to learn from Junaid and, you know, the this whole series has been so um, helpful for uh, so many uh, people in Pakistan and also abroad. I think a lot of people from here in U.S. are... Um, benefiting from this series. Um, I think uh, the way forward to really um, like people like uh, Hasni, Sarfraz Hasni and, you know, Junaid and you um, is to uh, maybe uh, because in Apna Merit, we had started this tradition of uh, doing the um, courses. And I think a course which is self-paced, paid course, online course, would be great to to house on uh, Apna Merit Academy. Um, that is one thing that I think is would be very useful uh, in addition to these uh, great lectures. But you know, if, but the advantage of a course is that it takes you from point A to point Z, A to Z. Um, and, and at the end of the course, you should know how to uh, do that job. I think that would be my suggestion. And if others have some something else. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. And we have Dr. Mustafa Siddiqui. I think we, we have the galaxy of the people this time. So we are so lucky. Most of the people, they are around. So over to you. Would you like to comment something? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Junaid Bhatti. It was uh, uh, it was a great talk, and I'm sure uh, many would have really benefited for uh, from it. My only comments, as a so I'm a, a clinician scientist, uh, is um, that um, now you have these three templates to use uh, for systematic review, for randomized control trial, and observational studies. So if you have never gone into research, start with observational studies and start with case series. That's that's your first step into research. And now you have a template. So whatever your idea is, use that template and go over those question answer things uh, as a checkbox to have your basis covered. It's always a good idea to have uh, your methods aligned at the start of the research. So uh, this is, I think this uh, uh, talk should be viewed by many others who were not present as well uh, on YouTube. So one question I have uh, for you, Junaid, is um, this um, discussion about chat GPT is very, very interesting. And I've been following this. Uh, the, 
at this time in research, uh, concerns for chat GPT are that there are, um, um, uh, it, uh, it's a language model and uh, not a research model and um, it will give you wrong references, false yeah. citations and really, then there are issues about plagiarization. So many um, journals have come up with guidelines about uh, how chat GPT can be used and you have to uh, put it as a disclaimer that this part of that was used uh, 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 for chat, uh, chat GPT. So my thought at this time was that we in who uh, are not, uh, English is not their first language. We all are uh, in the same boat on that. Uh, copy, uh, English copy editing of the article is probably a hard thing we all have to face where we we are good in research, but the copy editing part, we uh, end up having our article not very crisp. And that's where I feel there is a huge potential for things like chat GPT, especially the discussion part, the introduction part, not the methods part, not the results part, not the citations part, but do you have any comments on, on that, how um, AI can be used in copy editing research uh, articles? Yeah. So we have to distinguish between two technologies. One is the, that copy editing stuff, which Microsoft is also building itself. Like Microsoft right now, if you have a proper professional account, it does provide a very good grammatical thing, um, a review. And then you have this generative AI. So you provide some points, bullet points, and it starts generating the text based on that large language model. I'm, I doubt, uh, like, it will definitely help you to, like, if you have written a paragraph on something and you put in chat GPT and give a prompt rephrase, it's going to rephrase it. But it will still put some stylistic changes. You can also identify, like, in the prompt, I want this paragraph to be written for a scientific journal, rephrase this paragraph. And then you put in the comma and write the paragraph and it will give you a very good same length, similar length paragraph uh, that will take into account of large language model. Other way of approaching this is, so I, I, I have both ChatGPT account, paid accounts, as well as Grammarly account. So Grammarly is another tool that is available outside of Microsoft that I pay for. So if I need to write something up, I can also write in Grammarly. So Grammarly is a tool that is designed specifically to correct those mistakes, editorial mistakes, make it more crisp. So technology is there. Chat GPT's purpose right now is very different from what Grammarly has developed or whatever Microsoft is trying to sort of like bring it up because Microsoft always had this spelling correction and all of that, but now they're they are working on it. And most of that is available if you are writing your, your study in, uh, online uh, in a Microsoft like SharePoint or other things. So it, it has those those tools available depending upon your enterprise uh, uh, like account with them. So technology is there. I don't recommend ChatGPT to correct the grammatical mistakes yet. I would recommend Grammarly, but at some point in future, people will still be, people will still be, are still using it. I understand it, but scientific paper, uh, like making it more crisp, uh, is still a very human thing. Um, so um, I I also have used paid services in in the past in which we have to pay people who are from England or other other English speaking who are native language is English to go through that. So we are not there yet, but these tools can definitely get us seventy percent six uh, or sixty percent there. Not hundred percent. We can use them. Chat GPT not recommended at this point, but people will still use it. Thank you very much uh, for your comment, uh, quite comprehensive comment. So we are thankful to all of the participants and uh, over to Dr. Sarfraz. And I must acknowledge with great thanks about Dr. Sarfraz. So he has kindly accepted my invite to be the permanent, um, you know, the moderator of these things. So that's one of the challenge to be available uh, most of the time. So I'm, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Sarfraz. So we are like a little bit over time. So I'll request him really to thanks to all of you 
the participant and then close the session please thank you so much so um thank you again for all the participants i know it's the hour is late and it's ramzan time so a lot of you are maybe fasting but again, a great thanks to Janet uh, for sharing his knowledge and uh, Rosaire for, um, you know, making these sessions happen. And uh, Mustafa and uh, Dr. Shahid Rabi for also their comments and the questions. And uh, we'll announce the next session. Uh, so uh, be on the lookout for that. And again, um, I appreciate your kind words, but, you know, just just a little contribution I can do. It's not much, but thank you so much, Dr. Prasad. All right, with that, we'll end and uh, we'll see you next time. Please look out for the uh, announcements. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all of you.